to the seventh session of the CRCR coaching course. Um, we'll give everybody a few more minutes uh, to join in uh, and we'll get started pretty close to the top of the hour. Um, we have a lot of information in today's session that we'll want to get through. Um, we will um, uh, have one more session next week um, and then we'll take a break for Thanksgiving and then we'll come back and do a refresher course um, that following week and then we're done. So uh, those of you that have walked through the entire uh, series with me, uh, I thank you um, and hopefully it's helping you prepare and focus on uh, getting uh, certified and obtaining your CRCR. So we're looking forward to seeing all those successful um, examinations and you're passing the courses. So, um, okay. Uh, today we're going to be going over um, a few sections here. I think we're doing four one through four five today. Um, so there's a lot of material in here. It gets into a lot of detail. Um, reminder, please make sure you're following along um, with respect to your um, e-learning um, on HFMA. Um, uh, Anthony is manning the chat, uh, chat for us right now. Um, and so as we, thank you, Anthony, um, as we uh, have questions, uh, please put them in the chat um, and we'll review them at the end of the session. Um, we're going to ask everybody to stay off of audio and video for now uh, because we are, um, uh, we are tape, uh, recording this. Um, and if you haven't uh, heard yet, this will be on the Florida YouTube chapter, um, HFMA chapter YouTube channel. Um, so go out there, um, you can use this to refresh it for, and you can certainly for those that have missed them, trying to catch up, that should be all available. We get it up there within a day or two usually. Um, we will open it up for questions again at the end. Um, so feel free at that point, if you wanna join us on video and audio, I'm happy to have you, uh, you know, come in and we'll do live questioning as well. Okay, so today's section is cash posting and electronic remittance advice and fund transfers. Um, in this section, we're going to learn about internal controls, which are very important for both cash handling and posting. We're going to recognize what an electronic fund transfer is or an EFT. And we're going to talk about the electronic remittance advices are the ERAs. Cash handling opens the potential for fraudulent activities and requires controls to ensure the safeguarding of cash flow. These controls include the separation of cash handling procedures where the same person who opens and endorses the check is not responsible for the deposit the establishment of internal audits outside the involved department, um, the routine use of outside auditors to track cash flow, the routine reconciliation of dash daily cash against deposits, postings, and write-offs, and the use of multi-level authorizations for refund checks, write-off, and disbursements. Policies and procedures should segment responsibility so that no one individual has the ability to post charges, payments, and write-offs without a balancing control. Large adjustments, write-offs, charge transfers, refunds should require a manager level authorization. Some can even go up to the CFO or the CEO depending on the dollar values. Um, many health care providers um, got a little smart um, and have eliminated mail payment delivery through the use of bank lockboxes. Um, it not only improves security, but also expedites the deposit of funds. Many are also capable of providing the de deposit details into a postable 835 ERA file, including patient cash. So as you can see, this is a very time consu consuming process with multiple detailed steps that can be fraught with error and potential fraud. Um, again, this is one of the reasons why providers recognize that this is not something that we should be doing internally and engage with banks and vendors to do all of this processing for them. Um, 
General ledger cash requires the same separation of duties that we talked about with respect to um, you know, AR cash, patient cash, insurance cash. Um, and that typically includes things like cafeteria receipts, gift shop receipts, and parking receipts. So electronic fund transfer, or the EFT, um, is the electronic transfer of funds from payer to payee through the banking system. It is considered the fastest way to move money because it is possible to transfer funds between banks on the same day. Think kind of uh, EFT is uh, Venmo or Zelle in our world today, right? Um, this is a network of money movement available to banks through the Federal Reserve System. So EFT balancing and controls. The use of EFT greatly simplifies cash balancing and controls since the cash is deposited directly into the provider's bank account. The bank informs the provider of the amount received and issues a deposit. The provider balances this to the electronic remittance advice received. Um, the actual posting of the EFT dollars to the accounts receivable may be accomplished in a variety of methods. Uh, typically predicated to the, on the receipt of either a paper remittance advice or an electronic remittance advice. Um, control logs must be maintained to ensure that all EFT deposits are posted to the patient accounting system in a timely manner. In addition to those controls, most providers require that no ERA or electronic remittance advice can be posted to the accounts receivable until it is matched and recon to funds within the bank or the, the EFT to ensure appropriate accounting controls and reporting of the AR. So 835, standard eight, uh, uh, HIPAA uh, requirement here, um, it is used to send payments to healthcare providers. It's, e it's used to make it uh, much easier to post things uh, without staff taking a paper EOB and manually posting it fraught with error. And as I said, many providers, many vendors um, can now take patient payments that might be posted into a lockbox, convert that into an 835 postable file and make that again much simpler and easier for posting to be done by the provider. There are various levels of working with the 835 when, when providers deploy them. Um, level one is the electronic receipt of data only. So an ERA is received and the information is printed. I, I try to not say, I, please, I hope people aren't still doing this anymore. The printout is then processed the same as a paper remittance advice. The advantage to that includes saving mail time for the remittances and a standard format for data entry. Level two is electronic receipt and electronic data entry. With this level, the electronic remittance is received. It's entered into the computer automatically um, or electronically and it's viewed on a terminal. Data entry tasks are eliminated through the automated entry of the information, but there usually continues to be a manual matching of remittance information to an individual account and the recon of charges submitted to the amount paid. So there still is that need to do a manual matching of remittance information on the level two deployment of 835s. Level three takes advantage of more automation, electronic receipt, data entry, recon, posting, and closing. Here the ERA is received, entered in computer electronically, the remittance states of hosted by the patient accounting software, sim simultaneously updating the patient's account. Standard adjustment codes must be established to automate entries for payments, write-offs, and contractual allowance. A lot of this will rely on proration rules and bills within your HIS system. And manual intervention is only needed if there is a disagreement, an error, or a recon process. Where providers should be in the industry today is level four, right? The total automation of receipt, data entry, payment posting, adjustment processing, matching to the EFT, and posting when the cash is in there. 
Um, not, not everybody has that capabilities. We understand it. That's why there are, you know, banks that can offer this service to it and other capabilities um, to one, avoid a lot of uh, duplication of efforts, manual efforts, um, and errors that can impact the accounts receivable. So some may only be able to do level one, but we do hope that most are striving to get to level four. So there are many components to each payer's remittance advice. They include the payment amount, information on zero payments, partial payments, contractual allowances, and patient deductible and co-payment responsibilities. Each transaction type must be balanced and controlled to ensure that incorrect payments are identified, incorrect contractual adjustments are identified, denials are identified, and the patient's account reflects the correct balance. Um, so typically the following steps will ensure proper balancing and control of the ERA. So downloading the ERA, review the payment amounts with the EFT payment amount, process against any system filters to identify items that require manual view, um, such as posted contractual adjustments does not match actual payer contractual adjustments. Anybody that's done cash posting knows that the word take back is something that we never want to hear on an ERA because take backs on the payer remittance advice um, absolutely causes issues with controls. Making sure that denials are posted appropriately and routed uh, based on uh, those park and rock codes, any zero payments that are received and any held claims that might be identified. Um, after resolving any all and filtered exceptions, then automatic account posting should be executed. So key points, we've addressed EFTs, ERAs, the various levels of the deployment of the ERA that can occur, and then certainly the importance of ensuring processes are in place to pre prevent fraud within that cash posting arena. Very easy to do if those controls are not truly in place. Okay, so our first polling question, what is an EFT? Give everybody a minute or so to look through that. Okay, Diane, want to close up? Wonderful. Yes, number three. It's the electronic um, transfer of funds. I guess the EFT probably gives it away as well. Uh, but the use of EFT greatly simplifies cash balancing and control requirements since the cash is deposited directly into the healthcare provider's bank account, and it is considered the fastest way to move money. Great. Okay, credit balances. In this section, we're going to talk about credit balances, why it's important to identify them and the impact on the AR, um, and then how to resolve them and hopefully work on preventing them as well. Okay, accounts receivable accounts have credit balances when the payments and contractual adjustments posted to an account exceed the total charges. It makes sense, right? It is important to identify and resolve credit balances in the AR for a couple of reasons. If credit balances are not identified separately from debit balances in the AR and the balances are netted, the healthcare organization's AR level is understated. Credit balances are a liability of the organization and should be and must be reported on financial statements as such. In addition, there are compliance requirements and anybody who had to do this knows how painful it can be. CMS requires that hospitals report all Medicare credit balance overpayments on a quarterly basis using form CMS 838, which must be signed and attested to by an officer of the hospital, specifically the CFO or the CEO. Finally, states also have reporting requirements related to credit balance accounts. But again, anybody that had to do that CMS 838 knows it is an extremely painful process. 
Credit balances are created a number of ways. Surprisingly, a large number of credit balances are not the result of overpayments, but of posting errors that must be corrected in the patient accounting system, issues with proration rules typically. Common factors also include billing and payment errors and hospital and payer system limitations. Um, allowance issues usually occur when there is a payer with multiple health plan and a patient was registered with the incorrect plan type. Therefore, the incorrect proration rule was applied and then the actual payment from the payer was, was more than what we thought it would be. Think of a registered as an HMO, but it's actually a PPO. PPO um, payment may be higher. Therefore, I'm gonna result in a credit balance. Um, large charge credits commonly originate from service departments that do not process charges within the organization's suspense days. Um, corrected claims will then have to be sent significant rework on the patient accounting department. Um, duplicate payments happens when a provider rebills claims based on non-payment from the initial bill submission. This was a common practice in the industry. Providers should not just be rebilling when claims are not paid. Um, and most payers do have edits to avoid paying duplicate claims. But if you don't get a duplicate payment, you're gonna get a duplicate claim rejection. So neither one of those are good. More proper follow-up is needed than just rebilling claims willy-nilly. Um, I know uh, some providers would just, if not paid in 30 days, auto submit another claim. That's not the solution to the problem. Um, if accuracy is not focused on in creating estimates, then credit balances will occur um, and, un and usually unhappy patients because they paid more upfront. Now, unfortunately, until we have real-time adjudication occurring, um, this will happen when benefits are checked and then a claim hits against it before your does and you ask for more money. Providers have limited control over that, unfortunately, uh, but making sure we use the word estimate is really why it's very important to state that. Um, and then primary and secondary claims processing doesn't happen too often, but it happens when the COB is not coordinated correctly. Um, or if the secondary is not aware of other coverage. But again, that's typically rare. Um, those payers are going to do everything they can not to, to pay you if they don't need to. For small credit balances under a certain dollar amount, other than patient and federal payers, those are excluded from those, the hospital should send at least one or two statements with the following information. Notification that a credit balance exists an explanation of how to request a refund, and the policy of absorbing small credits if no request is received within a certain time frame. Um, and this policy should be matched by a similar policy for small debit balances as well. There is a threshold where it, acts, it makes no sense for providers to spend time and resources to work small credit balances or small debit balances. Um, the cost of, outweighs the benefit to those. All right, so key points, um, you know, typically providers will think I don't have to worry about my credit balances. That's the least of my concern. I want to, you know, go after my cash. But unfortunately, there are impacts to the AR and the understatement of the AR if you have a large credit balance issue. Um, there is rework to be done, even if it's just correcting proration rules and correcting adjustments. Staff has to spend the time to do that. Um, uh, there is regulatory requirements for Medicare, um, and really what we should be doing is trying to eliminate credit balances that we have control over, particularly related to proration rules and registrations and plans. Okay, so polling question number two, um, which statement is not true about credit balances? All right, Diane. Uh, yeah, um, it is actually number one. 
Um, so uh, the so yeah, I mean, I know when sometimes when I put not true, hospital generated statements should be sent to patients regarding small credit balances, um, certainly. Uh, but uh, per HFMA, the correct answer is number one. Uh, there are compliance requirements. Um, CMS requires hospitals to report all Medicare credit balance overpayments on a quarterly basis using Form CMS 838. So um, when you go into the e-learning section, and these questions are coming straight from there. Um, if you go and choose the other than the CMS hospital compliance, it will give you its, its clarification of why that statement is not true. Um, so read through those to try to get clarity um, on the other things and why they don't feel that to be, um, that they feel they are true about credit balances. Okay. Let's move into exception-based processing and in uh, revenue cycle, nobody likes to hear the words rejections and denials. We'll talk about the differences on those, um, the reasons about denials and what providers need to do to prevent denials and various appeal levels, particularly when we talk about Medicare, right? So when we talk about rejections, the first thing a health plan does when processing a claim is to check to see if the patient is covered. They're going to look at the claim data to ensure that the date of service is within coverage dates for the patient and all data on the claim matches what is what is on file, like the name and the date of birth. For example, Medicare will reject a claim if the patient's name and MBI number do not exactly match the common working file or CWF. I mentioned once before at my facility in Maryland, we had this more often than I liked um, until I really got them to understand it um, because the patient's legal name was Harold, but literally they registered him as Bubba um, and had to remind them again that that is not his real name. Can we please put in his real name? Um, so if you think about um, getting a claim into the adjudication system of the insurance company, they can't bring it in if they can't find the member. Um, these typically will be found um, on that unsolicited 277 report that you should be getting through a clearinghouse or consuming into your HIS system for workflow. Um, inherently, um, providers have been uh, bad about working those and then claims will be found to be um, not on file, because they're not in the adjudication, you're not going to find them on the website, you're not going to find them there. Um, providers would just go rebuild, rebuild, rebuild with the same information, getting the same reject, um, not working the reject, and then rebilling it. So that's what, again why rebilling is not really the most appropriate thing to do without validating that you have the right information. Okay. So various, um, so after the initial claim is adjudicated and accepted into the payer system. Um, they're then gonna run it through additional reviews and additional requirements. Um, there are things such as, is the service covered by that patient's policy? Um, is the service medically necessary for the condition? Um, were authorization requirements followed? Um, have they exceeded um, any of the maximum number of visits they could have in a period of time, things like physical therapy, um, occupational therapy. Um, and, and then if not, um, it, the claim will be denied. Um, denials can occur throughout the revenue cycle. So it can happen pre-service. It can happen at time of service and it's gonna happen at post-service. Um, denial types are usually broken up into things like technical, clinical, and underpayments. And we'll talk about those in more detail. Um, technical denials is based on missing or incomplete claim information, such as demographic information, um, incorrect or uh, incomplete insurance information, um, no required author referral, no continued stay authorization, and exceeded frequency limits. Um, a good example for Medicare is when a mammogram screening is performed more than once within a 12-month period that claim will be denied. Um, clinical denials are associated with the care or service provided, and they may include the following. 
Um, diagno diagnosis, diagnosis does not cover uh, the treatment required. It's not medically necessary, um, inappropriate level of care, um, and maybe invalid uh, HICS, PICS, or CPT codes. So that's all related to both the care of the patient um, and coding initiatives. Underpayments are a challenge for providers because underpayments do not always have a, um, a denial code on it. Um, and depending on your uh, posting of your 835s, um, if you take your allowances at time of billing or you take your allowances at time of posting, um, th those types of um, underpayments are hidden denials you may or may not find through a payment variance type processes. So many times it is a um, level of care downgrade. Uh, you'll hear that the downgrading of services without a corresponding denial code. Um, and so you've got to really look in, and peck through payment variances to find those non-denial payments just didn't uh, pay based on the contractual you expected. Um, the problem with those types of payment variance solutions is, as we talked about credit balances, a lot of times contractual allowances can cause inappropriate debit allowances. And so they're working through contractual allowances that cause debit issues while they're trying to find the needle of the haystack to find those underpayments um, where most of the time they're not. Um, that This is where a lot of providers decide they'll bring it to a zero balance and they'll hire a contingency vendor that can come in and try to find additional ca cash and those underpayment reviews, zero balance reviews. So um, various outpatient denials, you can see what can happen um, when we're getting um, paid here, things like overlapping inpatient and outpatient claims that keep remember that we've got that three-day rule that um, outpatient claims within the three-day window must be on an inpatient claim. There's got to be appropriate edits there. If not, sometimes both your inpatient and your outpatient claim get denied, or sometimes your outpatient claim gets paid, but then your inpatient claim gets denied, which is probably worth a lot more money. Um, so patient accounting has the responsibility to identify and communicate claims denials to move to a strategy of where we all should be of denial prevention. They must understand, track, and trend the reasons for denials. But many providers recognize that there are so much impact by other departments, and they've created what we call denial prevention task force and other names like that, where they bring in all departments that have an impact on denials. They make them responsible for processes within their department that's causing accounts to get denied and the additional rework that goes with it if it's not written off because you can't get it overturned. Um, they are charged with looking at the data, getting to the root cause, um, improving performance and prevent denials moving forward. Um, I'll give you an example. We did create one of those when I was at university. Um, we had a significant volume of denials for no authorization for outpatient radiology. Um, anybody who's managed those knows that those are very difficult, if not impossible, to appeal um, due to the contractual requirement you have to get that authorization. Um, I had a financial clearance department. I was constantly hounding them about why are you not getting these authorizations. As we started looking at the details and looking at the accounts and getting into the root cause, we recognized that radiologist, and as it is absolutely happens, what is scheduled and what is authorized or financially cleared, there's add-on tests, there's changes in tests, et cetera. Um, and we recognized that if we were notified immediately in the financial counseling department that the test has changed, if we notify the payer that same day as to why we changed the test, we were, we were getting about 95% of them authorized that same day, resulting in a significant reduction in both the initial denials that needed to be reworked, and then timely filing the write-offs for the no authorization. So looking at root cause and working to process and prove it is an absolute effort across the entire provider uh, care continuum. Okay. Inpatient denials. Um, we mentioned in a few sections about the two midnight rule um, and the basic obtuse nature of what physicians need to do 
with respect to is it inpatient or is it outpatient? Um, and so there are quite a lot of denials um, where we build it as OBS, but it should have been inpatient or it should have been uh, OBS, but it, we build it inpatient. Um, obviously documentation does not support the medical necessity. Our care are not covered by medical documentation. Um, providers have had a significant a drive in clinical documentation improvement initiatives to ensure that these types of denials don't happen. And certainly if the documentation does not support medical necessity, um, other lack of documentation can also uh, impact um, DRG assignment because of uh, no, no documentation on the comorbidities um, it, with the initial diagnosis and any other underlying issues like say diabetes. Um, and then they do have other focused reviews um, the mission notification, anybody who's had to do that knows that's a very manual process. Many providers are now moving to putting electronic capabilities in for auto notification or using the uh, ANSI EDI 278 transaction set to notify the payers through the EDI uh, landscape. Um, and then payers put in focused reviews on the use of ops, was it appropriate, use of anesthesia and other areas that can result in denials and certainly uh, requests for medical records and clinical documentation that can uh, impact getting that cash in as quickly as we could. Recovery audit crack, crack contractors are a rack. Anybody who remembers when this came out remembers this was something that providers were uh, spinning on with their head as to how are we gonna deal with this and what is the impact to providers uh, cash and our processes. Um, and so the mission of the RACs is to protect Medicare from fraudulent and abusive billing. So when the RAC identifies improper payments in their perspective, they notify the MAC, the person who's actually providing and, and uh, administering the uh, benefits um, uh, of the applicable claims. The MAC will then adjust the claim to reflect the proper payment amounts in their system and then if it's an overpayment, then a demand letter is sent to the provider to the recover the payment. If the payment is not recovered, they will retract it. Um, don't think you can ignore it and it's going to go away. Um, so we'll talk about first the managing of denials and then certainly managing a, a RAC uh, audit is considered a denial as well, uh, but it's a very unique case. They also are doing that um, in the Medicaid world. So RACs and, and I think there's Mix and there's Zip Picks, there's all these different mnemonics that um, talks about recovery contractors throughout the landscape of insurances. Um, even um, commercial payers are getting into it as well where they do those post audit reviews. So just because you got payment to start with doesn't mean you get to keep payment all day. You know, you got it, great, I'm done. Now they're gonna come out and look. Um, so recognizing that denials have a significant impact on the revenue cycle. The most obvious impact is the lost reimbursement and increased collection fees, but productivity of staff is impacted as well as due to rework, research and appeal processes. Reports should include information such as denial type, organizations of denials, the source of it, the frequency and of cost the dollar amount. Um, they should be used to make process changes to eliminate future denials. Um, and they should also be used to track and document appeals and overturn rates. Sometimes providers um, are limited in the reporting capabilities that they have. Um, I usually say, if you think you don't have a denial rate, you're, then you're in denial about your denials. Um, everybody has denials. Some have better and are moving more to best practice and have less than a 2% of their NPR written off to denials, uh, but still a lot of rework there as well. Um, denials are avoidable and preventable. Um, so we just talked about the denial prevention processes. So looking at those financial clearance processes, where is it causing angst there? Where is your clinical documentation um, lacking in uh, being able to support the medical necessity of your care? Um, coding accuracy, um, ensuring it's being coded correctly and supports what the treatment is. And then any pre-bill edits that you can put into play to avoid a back-end denial. Can't always know we're gonna get denied, but a lot of pre-bill edits 
um, can be put in like those inpatient outpatient overlaps um, to avoid that happening in the first place. Um, so any individual dissatisfied with the government or health plans claim determination is entitled to the reconsideration of the decision with Medicare having clear guidelines and structure around those. Um, Medicare also has specific rules on provider appeals as well. Um, waiver of liability refers to a provision established by Medicare to protect beneficiaries and physicians from liability when services are denied as inappropriate or medically unnecessary. If the Medicare beneficiary had knowledge or should have had knowledge that they were not covered, they can be billed. If neither the patient or provider knew or reasonably could have known, to, expected to know, Medicare is liable to pay the claim. If a provider should have known or did not inform the beneficiary, think about ABNs that we mentioned multiple times, the beneficiary may not be billed. Um, Medicare beneficiaries and providers specifically have extensive rights to appeal individual coverage determinations. Now, all, all payers will allow you to have um, various appeal options as well and the various appeal levels, and those will typically be maintained within your contracts. Um, and certainly patients can um, appeal a provider, a payer determinations as well. Specific to the Medicare appeal process, um, and then specifically um, for the RAC processes is where we'll see this, but you can do it for more than that. Um, the first step is you go into redetermination, and that is at the MAC level. Um, and then if that is uh, denied, um, you then have the uh, opportunity to go to the reconsideration level, which is a qualified independent contractor. Um, a hearing before the ALG is, L ALJ is the third step that providers can take. Um, a P you can get to a uh, fourth step is the review by the Medicare Appeals Council. And then certainly the last and final step is a judicial review by a federal district court. I think as you can imagine, most providers can't maintain this or manage this um, appropriately. Uh, again, where a lot of vendors have come into play, uh, those primarily with legal and healthcare backgrounds, um, where they'll take these processes for you um, and uh, you know, pursue these through the channels, um, particularly ones that have physician advisory services um, up front. If you get denied based on what their determination was, they'll take this on as part of those services. So. Um, no, certainly a lot of providers will do redetermination and reconsideration, but once it goes beyond there, they really usually don't have the capabilities to manage that internally. Um, so non-government claim denials, um, again, the health insurance policy may give you guidance as to um, what the appeal timeframes are, but again, most of it's going to be in the contract terms, um, things like appeal timeframes, how many levels what the timeliness is, that's a very important thing to know um, as do I have 90 days, do I have 120 days, do I have 30 days to appeal it? And knowing what those are uh, is very important If you miss that timely filing of your appeal. Um, you will not be successful and there's usually no uh, uh, recourse at that point in time. And then contracts typically will state what is a non-appealable denial. Specific example would be authorization. If your contract says you must have authorization for these tests or for these services or even vaguer than that, and you do not get authorization, those are very rarely appealable and overturned. Um, and then certainly HIPAA requirements will be clearly uh, identified in those appeal processes. Right. So key points, hopefully what you came away from there is the, the rework and the cost to the uh, providers when claims are rejected, when claims are denied because we didn't do what we needed to do upstream in the processes um, is key to try to avoid moving forward um, so that your cash and your margins can remain solid. Um, so providers need to focus a significant amount of time on those denial prevention efforts.
All right, we're going to move to the next um, polling question. Which option is not a type of denial? Again, not. Okay, Diane, let's close that out. Hopefully that was an easy one for everybody. Yep, a contractual adjustment is part of the patient's bill that a provider must write off because of contractual arrangements with the health plan. So try to throw an easy one there. Um, okay, got about 10 minutes to get through two more sections. So um, exception-based processing and not paid claims. We'll talk about follow-up procedures for unpaid claims and common account resolution procedures. Um, so the clean claim payment cycle should be determined for all major health plans. And then that will determine what your follow-up activities should look at. So for example, if Medicare pays clean claims within 14 days and it's not received within the time frame, and it's not on uh, the uh, FTP to back to the provider, um, then follow-up should begin and work queue should be set up so staff starts following it based on that time frame. Certainly providers should make sure that they're looking at time and lag to uh, when payments might get made. So if it's a three-day payment window um, for you to actually get an ERA, post it and, and uh, alleviate the AR, then you don't really wanna make it day 15 because they may be touching claims that were actually paid um, that you don't, you, you don't want them to do. So, the staff has to look at really what their days are going to be. Um, electronic follow-up methods. Again, we mentioned before, don't just go rebuild claims automatically. It's going to cause you more pain and rework down the line. Um, so many uh, payers um, now have their claim status on their website. Um, you can use solicited 276s, 277s to try to get the status of a claim. It'll give you some information. Um, many uh, payers have moved their data more into their website. So logging in, checking the claim status um, is an option. Um, and many of our providers are now automating that um, using technology to go out, eliminating the staff from doing it, um, going out, getting the claim status and bringing that back in to drive exception-based workflow. Um, as we said, the clearinghouse will have the solicited 276s, 277s to drive workflow from those capabilities. And then certainly working the Medicare common working file or the FIS system um, and working your return to provider claims um, is key to effective Medicare follow-up. If you don't stay on top of your TB9997, which has your rejected claims for Medicare, your Medicare cash is going to be significantly impacted. Um, so prioritizing it, um, certainly what is my priority? Am I going to work by dollar value? Am I setting my staff up by uh, payer plan level? Um, am I going to, what, what is my uh, whip, right? What is my work in progress? Um, and how do I uh, balance load my staff against my whip? Um, obviously knowing what your payment turnaround is. Um, and understanding I should not work Medicare claims or Medicaid claims maybe till day 30 because their adjudication cycle for Medicaid and Medicaid Advantage plans are very low, right? So um, understanding that don't follow up on a claim until it makes sense. Try to find those claims too. If you can get rid of those claims that are paid, if you can accelerate your denied claims, um, if those that are pending, nobody touches those, and then I can actually bring up my problem claims sooner, which are those that are not on file at the payer website, not found. Those are my problem claims. Those are the ones I need to know about, but finding that is like a needle in a haystack. So, you know, finding effective methodology to avoid unproductive touches. Um, I remember looking at what my staff would be doing um, and, you know, 85% of the work that they did was their, their statement and their activity was, Checked payer website, claim on file, up for payment. That's an extremely unproductive touch. They didn't need to do anything to bring in the cash. I needed them to work on the other uh, cases that they weren't getting to, not the ones that were going to get paid. 
Um, we've come a long way since I was managing revenue cycles. So um, really, we need to be effective. We have to be smart about the activity that we have. Um, liability players, um, the claims must include the occurrence and value codes, identifying the claim as an accident. Remember, premise, premise accidents do not apply for within their own home. It's only if somebody comes to your home and gets hurt. If you get hurt in your own home, it goes under the medical coverage. Um, Medicare allows providers to submit liability claims after a 120 day period, but the provider must cancel the claim against the liability payer as Medicare will then go after the liability payer directly. Um, and then liens um, can, uh, is our claim against real or personal property that secures payment of a debt or performance of some other kind and gives the creditor the right to have their claims satisfied from the specific property, like a house, before the owner gets any payments. Type of liens include agreement, judicial, and statute. So key points, luckily it's a small section there. Um, effective AR management is important to ensure your staff is productive. Um, and then when it, it, we didn't really talk about this, honestly, when can an unpaid clean third party claim become the patient's responsibility? Most people don't do that because contractually you're not allowed to, maybe in a non-contract provider, billing a patient just because your insurance didn't pay is probably not the most effective way to try to get your cash. Um, you can notify the patient. Um, and then again, the payment cycle. Okay, um, so polling question. Which option is not a lien type? And for some reason in the section, HFMA thought the not an option was the most appropriate way to ask questions, uh, which is fine. Okay, Diane, let's uh, close that out so we can use the things for payment. Um, actually, um, no, um, the correct answer is subrogation. Subrogation is not a lien type, but instead a process used to pursue payment. Um, agreement, judicial, and statutory are all um, lien types um, that we talked about on the slide prior. So again, go into the HFMA e-learning and it'll tell you exactly why they believe that the only, the correct answer is subrogation. All right, last section here today. Um, we're gonna talk about self-pay follow-up um, and the importance of patient balance billing after insurances. We're gonna talk about the difference between bad debt and charity, and then the Medicare bad debt rules and their financial impact. Um, so anything that is, includes a deductible typically um, co-payment, co-insurance balances, non-covered services that you're allowed to build your base at patients. Um, so uh, process according to patient liability guidelines, as I mentioned, I, I don't see patient, I don't see, see providers really doing this too much. Um, it's not an effective management of insurance balances to try to bill your patients. You can notify them, you can call them. Um, they may get involved, but simply pulling it down to uh, patient balance and trying to pursue the patient for it to get them to get their insurance to pay it. It's probably the most effective, uh, not the most effective way. Patients will get angry. Uh, patients will just ignore the bill because they'll know they're not really liable. Um, and um, I think if you want legal, uh, there would be some concerns as to why you didn't get the insurance to pay. So um, other avenues to pursue unpaid balances, particularly for um, payers that are difficult to work with and maneuver with, uh, probably taking action against them through some course um, is better than trying to go after your patient. But the verbiage is out there. There are some uh, contract and state or federal regulations that prohibit the provider from, from pursuing open insurance liabilities from the patient. Um, identifying, identifying and evaluating bad debt and charity cares are critical functions in the overall management of the AR. Before writing it off to charity or bad debt, 
the hospital must establish policies, define appropriate criteria, and implement procedures for identifying, processing accounts, and monitoring compliance. Financial accounting and 501R regulations specify the various parts of this policy. A board approved financial assistance policy is a fundamental requirement for correctly identifying charity and bad debt. Um, so the fundamental differences between the, the differences, um, the whether it's your, your propensity to pay or your ability to pay. Um, and if I go to bad debt, I'm not qualified for charity. It just means I don't want to pay you. It doesn't mean that I can't pay you. Um, I just don't want to pay you. Um, where financial assistance is, I don't have the ability to pay you. Determining the difference between this is key for providers, particularly under the 501R compliance and 990 reporting and meeting their community community benefit, particularly for for-profit providers. Um, there are many factors of self-pay follow-up and account resolution. Um, many use the federal poverty guidelines as a mechanism for financial assistance. Um, some um, parties design guidelines that fit the needs of their community, the mission of their hospital, and their demographics. Um, before writing off an account, providers should ensure all 30 third-party payments owed were received and document appropriate collection efforts were taken. Insurance receivables should not be classified as bad debt or charity. Cannot tell you how many times I've had that debate with people. Um, a patient is eligible when the provider is provides all documentation, uh, usually includes tax return, employment check, bank stubs, meets the income criteria. Um, there's also presumptive uh, financial assistance to reclassify that debt uh, to charity when data and scoring determines they would be eligible if they just applied. Um, catastrophic is from when patients have serious medical conditions. We take into consider their income, how much they could pay, and then we reduce the balances accordingly. Um, Medicare requires that patients be pursued for a minimum of 120 days after which they are referred to a bad debt agency. Um, current Medicare regulations provides bad debt reimbursement to hospitals to compensate for uncollected Medicare beneficiary self-pay balances. Um, and there are many, well, most hospitals now offer rather extensive discounts based on income and offer prompt payment based discounts. Um, FAP requirements came in with the ACA Act as well but it only applies to nonprofit providers. Um, so the key points that we talked about um, is the um, differences between bad debt, charity care, the need to di differentiate between that, the need to meet your community benefit and the Medicare regulations that came in to provide more charity to your patients, even when they don't comply with an application. Um, and then um, you know, just making sure you're doing what's right for your patients, pursuing a balance from a patient that cannot pay, making sure they understand it um, is a better conversation than trying to go after patients that cannot pay you. Going after a patient that will not pay you that can is a whole different story. Um, okay, tried to get that through that quickly. Um, that last polling question, what is not a component of a financial assistance application? We'll give that a couple of 30 seconds or so, um, and then we'll see if there's any questions and open it up for any live questions. Okay. Um, actually, mission statement is, is a component of FAP. Uh, the correct uh, and as is payment methods and installment arrangement guidelines. The registration record is not a component of an FAP. That's just the record of the accounts that they have. So mission statements, payment methods, et cetera, are all components of it. Um, and, you know, there is this slide will clearly, I'm going to kind of go back here. Here's your financial assistance policies and those key elements which includes the mission statement, uh, payment methods, and installment arrangement guidelines. Registration record is not included in that. 
Okay. All right. So Anthony, um, that's it. For, oh, one more, sorry. One more polling question. Which option does not have to be considered in self-pay follow-up guidelines? Like I said, HFMA was on a not kick when they wrote this uh, unit. Um, so which option does not have to be considered in self-pay follow-up guidelines? And uh, we'll close that up, uh, Diane, and we'll move to any questions. Patient open balance billing, yep, you got it. It's uh, not a factor self-pay follow-up in account resolution, but when the account balance shifts to the patient, then processing is continued according to patient liability and follow-up guidelines. So uh, I'm not seeing a lot of questions in the chat, but Anthony, any questions that are out there and then anybody want to ask something live, feel free. Yeah, well, while we wait for some questions, um, you know, encourage everyone that uh, participating today to go ahead and turn on your camera and your unmute your microphone if you can, and feel free to uh, ask your question verbally or go ahead and put it in the chat and I can always read it off for you. Uh, while we wait, a quick, a quick couple of updates. Um, we have some upcoming events. Diane, if you could help with those in the chat, the registration links, at least for the ones we have uh, set up yet. Um, on December 10th, we have our next fun committee and education session and our holidays special. Um, two education sessions and a holiday happy hour um, with a signature cocktail and mixology instructional um, kind of a Zoom session. Uh, should, should be really great um, opportunities to, uh, to donate to a good cause. Um, Diane, if you could, uh, again, if you could add that info to the chat so that everyone can go ahead and link there. Um, and then registration is not quite open yet, but uh, for those of you in the South Florida region, um, oh, there, uh, that's right. There's also a education webinar one-off on November 18th that is free to all. So please go ahead and register for that if you get a chance um, and need those critical CEUs while we're all in this virtual environment. So um, yeah, again, for the, for the South Florida uh, crowd, uh, December 17th, Three Sons Brewing Company on Dania Beach. Uh, we will be having our HFMA South Region Holiday Party. Um, we are doing a toy drive to benefit Jack and Jill of Broward County. So if um, we're, we're working on the final um, details for that, but it'll be around $25 to participate a person. It'll include um, some beer sampling and the, the amazing food that they make at the brewery also going to uh, support Jack and Jill. So. Um, Stay tuned for that. The Save the Date is up on the website. And um, hopefully by the next time we get together here on this session, I'll be able to let you know that registration is up and ready to roll. Um, so yeah, that's it for housekeeping, really. Um, any questions, anyone? Anything we need to touch on again or kind of uh, have Christine talk through for us? Everybody's ready. Seven sessions in, everybody's good to everybody's go. Everybody's ready, yeah. There, so just to, again, there was a lot of material in the section. And as we said, we we're trying to get you prepped to get out there and get certified. Um, so I only touched on a piece of it. There's no way we can go through everything, particularly the section was very, uh, had a lot of info. So I encourage you to go out, take those sections um, and read through the materials. And uh, certainly any questions you have in the meantime, uh, let us know. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Next week, I believe, Diane, we are back to Thursday. Um, we will have uh, a break for the Thanksgiving week. I don't think anybody wants to be talking to me on Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, we'll then follow up with the following week with our last section session, um, which will be a refresher of everything that we've done so far. Okay. Great. Well, you know, you all stay safe out there. Hopefully nobody's being impacted by the weather too severely here in Florida. Um, and we'll talk to you all next week. Have a good day.